Okay, thanks. So, yeah, hello everybody. It's my pleasure today to talk to you today about challenges in scheduling of virtual CPUs. Um, bear with me that we're doing this remote today. Unfortunately, my train got canceled. So, what I want to talk about today, uh, I want to do a brief warm up, some basics of virtual scheduling, nothing too fancy, and then go through some complexities um, that are aligned with such scheduling um, intentions. First one, just being host overhead, very obvious and trivial, and then some more complex ones, uh, some ordering issues with virtualized infrastructure and uh, the uh, issue of complexity of overcommitment. And finally, I want to talk about the letter complexity and how we plan to um, address this issue or this complexity in the ARC S390 subtree um, by exploiting uh, functionality of the underlying hypervisor on that architecture, um, in, which is ex essentially a virtualization layer in itself. But first things first, um, just some basics on virtual CPU scheduling. Probably most of you know, each virtual CPU in a guest on KVM, for example, is a process which has to get mapped onto a physical CPU. Um, and if I have more guests, I need more mapping. If it's simple like this, I have as many virtual CPUs as physical CPUs. It's of course straightforward. I could just map everything straight through, um, but we already get into the first very simple complexity. KVM has to do some additional stuff. It has to do some memory uh, arrangements for the virtual guests or just simple things like logging. That already leads to uh, the point that a, a virtual CPU can obviously not use a physical CPU, CPU at 100%, and the host has to take decisions on when to schedule virtual CPUs away and make room for its own needs in that case. So that's very simple, very trivial, um, nothing that does any harm uh, in a severe way. If we go to the second level of complexity, it's virtualized infrastructure. We have the same image as above, uh, as before, um, obviously here. Um, and now we're just adding virtual infrastructure. So a virtual guest might want to talk with a physical interface to the uh, outside world. It might want to access a virtual disk or two virtual guests might want to um, talk to each other through virtual, virtual network which leads to some interesting more complexities because now quite obviously, again, the vCPU has to do some more, has to undergo more contention for the physical CPU because that infrastructure um, has to be dealt with as well. I want to talk about one specific example, which is a virtual network connection, which uh, implies the usage of a vHost. As you can see in this image, um, there is quite a process undergoing or a, a set of actions that need to be taken. So if app one on the left-hand side wants to talk to app two on the right-hand side, um, essentially a whole uh, cascade of events is triggered. Essentially, the task puts data into a virtual queue to virt queue. Uh, which is monitored by vHost and then notifies KVM that it's done that, which then triggers the vHost um, task to um, deal with that. Uh, vHost then interacts with a socket file, which triggers a KWorker, which in turn triggers vHost on the target virtual machine, which then uh, wakes up um, a virtual CPU and the second guest on the right-hand side through an interrupt mechanism. Um, it's not necessarily going to too much detail there what is happening in there. The important part is um, all of these actions have to happen in this order such that the transfer that the transfer of data can successfully be completed. Why is this important? Um, with the switch from the completely fair scheduler to the EEVDF scheduler, um, we saw some interesting scenarios where um, we would see some performance degradations. 
in some cases. Um, on the left side, you see a normal run or execution of this vhost part. First, the vCPU is doing something, then vhost1, the K worker, then vhost2, and then the virtual CPU2. Um, the length of the bars represents how much runtime they usually consume. So you can see that the virtual CPUs are using a lot of runtime, of course, whereas vhosts and kvarks are usually uh, running uh, just on a very short time base. Um, occasionally, we are seeing some outliers there as well, um, where a kvarker might all of a sudden run longer than usual and overtake the vhosts from a runtime perspective, um, which is in the area of four to five digit nanosecond values, so really not much. But in the completely fair scheduler, we were seeing that um, the regular case would allow the, um, the K worker to generate some bonus time, let's say, um, where it, even if it would uh, take longer at one instance, it would not get penalized uh, by the completely fair scheduler. Whereas the uh, EVDF scheduler, for example, um, would uh, connotate that um, longer runtime for the K worker with a uh, lag value all of a sudden, which would prevent it from being scheduled on uh, wake up um, immediately, which would then cause the vhost to uh, loop for a while before getting migrated off uh, the CPU. And only then the K worker would get scheduled, which causes a lot of um, delay, in fact, in the whole um, process. This, in turn, shows that there is an importance of process ordering um, in a virtualized environment, which is quite obvious, which is also true for other uh, scenarios, of course. And while we want a certain order of processes, um, there is, of course, the question how we can make sure that that order is um, ideally kept or communicated uh, in some way. Um, there are multiple ways how we could think about this, which are shown here. One could think about maybe having some transaction concept where that uh, chain of schedules or wake ups um, is predetermined. Um, we could also think about something that we do a more specific yield command where we say, I really want this task to run. Um, could also be thought of that K workers might need some uh, additional prioritization boost when they are woken up, um, or we have to check whether it might make sense to add something to the EVDF scheduler to make it more tolerant to one of outliers. Um, all of these proposals have one thing in common: they are uh, um, they're requiring. Um, some conceptual changes, which might, of course, come with a lot of side effects and make this uh, difficult um, effort to, um, to solve problems like this, where you want to make sure that the order is kept in place. There's a different approach in the third complexity, the overcommitment uh, there, where we are actually seeing that we might be able to use some functionality from the S390 uh, hardware um, to um, gain some improvements here. And I want to show this right now real quick. So we start with the previous image again with the overhead of the host and the uh, virtualized infrastructure. And now we just add more CPUs such that we now have more virtual CPUs than physical CPUs, which is obviously the case in most of uh, the virtualized environments. Um, now we get to the point where this image changed to a point where we're not only competing uh, with infrastructure and host overhead, but also with other virtual CPUs, because we have to share the physical CPUs now with them. And now the virtual CPUs therefore start to see steal time. So some of their runtime on the physical CPU gets stolen by another um, virtual CPU. Um, this comes with some additional um, issues. So with just one virtual CPU, um, we are, of course, just running straight through. All is good. If we have two virtual CPUs, we already get to the point where we have to take turns. And with four virtual CPUs, we have to take turns with all the other CPUs, if we're assuming that all of them have to be scheduled on a single physical CPUs. 
An issue here is that we don't know when we will get interrupted by other virtual CPUs and for how long that is the case, um, which is especially tricky if we get into scenarios where we take a spin lock and hold that and then get scheduled off from the physical CPU, another virtual CPU is um, executing. And at the same time, another virtual CPU might want to have the same spin lock that we have just taken um, and therefore has then to wait until it's our turn again, potentially. So now I want to talk how we want to address this particular problem in the Arc S390 subtree. Um, on our architecture, we have uh, our architecture is essentially a virtualized environment already. So there are some um, names that have changed here now. We are not longer having KVM as a hypervisor, but uh, Prism, which is hypervisor on the platform. And the guests are called LPAS, just to make sure that we are now in a specific environment. And what can happen here is first, we have a thing called horizontal polarization, which means that we distribute equally how much CPU we are allowed to use. An important thing here is that we can have different weights per virtual machine, for Alpha in this case. So you can see that the purple machine has a weight of two and thereby is allowed to use two physical CPUs uh, or is entitled to do that. So the green one only has one, orange three and blue two. If the system is overall idle, only one guest is running, it can of course use for physical CPUs to do whatever it wants to do. But if all guests are using, um, are running at 100%, these entitlement numbers mean essentially, although I have four virtual CPUs, I can only get the equivalent of two physical CPUs uh, on runtime. And now there are, of course, already uh, some indirections like how is my work now distributed if I'm, let's say, uh, Alpha Purple? If I run on my four CPUs now and I can only uh, use physical CPUs one and two below, um, I already have the problem that I'm stealing time from myself again because the hypervisor has to distribute those four virtual CPUs onto two, two physical CPUs and of each CPUs. Um, not knowing exactly when the switches happen and so on and so forth. It could only be a bit different where you have some gradients in there. So you might have some parts of some CPUs, so some more sharing, um, which would make the timing even more complex and also raise questions about the cache topology. Because again, I can never be 100% sure where my task is running right now from a guest's perspective. This can, of course, all be addressed through host settings as well. You could go ahead and start pinning CPUs, but that gives you a different sort of headaches, uh, potentially. So the difference now that we want to exploit is that as a counterpart to horizontal polarization, it makes sense to have something called vertical polarization, which essentially means that the hypervisor is telling the guest um, about its entitlement in more detail. So you can see that the purple one has an entitlement of two CPUs, which in the end means that the hypervisor gives that information to the guest and says, okay, your virtual CPUs one and two, those are uh, vertical high, which means they get to run on physical CPUs one and two whenever they want. So if I start scheduling work there, I can run there uninterrupted. So I will never see steal time in there, ideally. Um, and I can be sure that I can process whatever I want to process um, in there. Yeah, Tobias, uh, we have like five the, minutes, FYI. So if you, um, I don't know if there's any discussion you want to start getting into, you probably want to move towards that. If there's any. It's other, there are not many more slides anymore, not added more slides, that many more slides left. So just a brief word, the vertical lows are a bit of, uh, they don't, necessarily get any uh, entitlement. So if they don't um, run, so if you schedule work on there, you cannot be sure that they will um, see any runtime and they might um, be blocked to a certain degree. To address these issues, uh, it's necessary to make sure that there is not anything scheduled onto the vertical lows. Um, 
the advantage is if I have that knowledge, the guest can have better planning and scheduling on the virtual CPUs. And if it works well together with PRISM and the other LPARs, it can achieve a better throughput in the end. And now the proposal on how we thought about approaching this is one uh, CPU capacity approach where you would give the high vertical high CPUs a high amount of capacity and the vertical lows a small amount of capacity, which is a uh, not invasive change because you can do all of that in the arc direct in our arc uh, subtree. Um, but it is not as strict because the vertical lows might still run tasks in the end. Um, and another approach that we are thinking about right now is a change to the load balancer, where we essentially would add a new scheduler group type beyond uh, group overloaded, which would mean we can flag um, certain CPUs um, to not be used um, by giving them a higher or a worse grading than overloaded, which makes the load balancer pull work all work from those CPUs and prevents those CPUs from pulling any work, which is more strict but it requires changes to the common load balancer. Um, and those are the things that we are currently looking at right now. Um, our goal is uh, to prioritize entitled CPU for the overcommitment scenario because the issues in the virtualized infrastructure are uh, of a more complex area. And we have these two approaches now in mind. And in fact, in the follow-up uh, talk by Srikant, um, you will hear some more technical details because they came up with a similar idea uh, as well. So that's that. And then I think we have a couple of minutes left for some brief questions, maybe. Yeah. So, so specifically, is, is there anything that you're looking for? Because ideally, uh, the uh, uh, microconference topics are supposed to be more like, okay, here's what we're doing, here's where we're stuck, here's where we would like to have some advice. I mean, is there something that you are looking for yourself in that aspect? Yeah, so one thing would, of course, be how far uh, we can get with the capacity approach, of course. And again, Shrikant in the following talk will go into more detail about this, actually, and whether such a, challenge, a change in the load balancer is something that could be realistic um, if we try to keep it as least invasive and less uh, impactful to other architectures, per se. So that would be the idea. Uh, it just looks similar to the problem that are faced with kind of performance core and energy efficient cores with the new Intel CPUs and ARM Big Little. I mean, those those vCPU which might have their CPU associated seems like more performance versus the other ones. So maybe there are some common infrastructure to put there. There definitely are some common things. I might just add to that. Um, the only difference is that we really need to make sure that there is no tasks running on those smaller CPUs uh, to get the best possible results. So the capacity approach is a bit of a softer approach, and we are also trying to evaluate if a harder, stricter approach, that's a better word, might make more sense. So do you need this, uh, this resource allocation to be static, or can it vary um, during time, I mean, as time passes, and the system gets new requirements. This can actually change because, of course, um, while we don't want load on the vertical low CPUs while the system is fully in use, we really would like to use them if they're available just to overconsume and perform better during that point in time. Thank you, Tobias. Thank you.